This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Preservation Conversations, um, episode 17. Um, hard to believe August is already halfway more than halfway over at this point. Um, and we've already got 17 episodes of these preservation conversations under our belt. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, we're very excited for today's topic, um, stone walls and how to identify, document, and evaluate them in historic landscapes. So just a little bit about, um, just a few housekeeping reminders uh, for those who haven't um, been with us before. Um, we ask that you please mute your phones. Um, it just helps keep down on background noise and everybody can hear clearly. Um, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them um, during the presentation using the chat feature, uh, which looks like a little conversation bubble on your GoToMeeting console. Um, we're gonna reserve time at the end of the presentation for questions. Um, and also, as you probably heard, um, this presentation is being recorded and is going to be posted on Preservation Massachusetts YouTube channel and our website um, within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. So um, we started these preservation conversations way back in the beginning of April um, as a means to positively connect, communicate, and share. Um, while we were all um, stuck working from home. Um, but it's really evolved into a great educational resource and Preservation Massachusetts has been um, very thankful for everybody who's joined us live and in person and for those uh, who watch um, after the fact. And we are just very thankful for, um, for you attending and also for all of our presenters who've helped with us. And um, speaking of presenters, we are joined today by a special uh, guest speaker, Jeff Howry, who is going to present on stone walls, um, how to identify document and evaluate them in historic landscapes. Um, Jeff is, um, is a, 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 I would say, a preservationist, a, a preservationist, and back in 2018, he wrote the nomination for historic stone walls uh, to be listed on um, our Massachusetts Most Endangered Historic Resources list for 2018. He's presented at our statewide um, conferences about historic stone walls, so we are very pleased to have him here with us today. Um, and additionally, we also have the Preservation Mass um, team on as well. Um, myself, I'm Erin Kelly, Associate Director. We have Jim Igo, our President and CEO, our two circuit riders, Jeff Gagne and Stacia Kaplinson, and then um, also we're always joined by Chris Skelly from the Massachusetts Historical Commission. So with all of that being said, I am going to turn the presenter duties over to Jeff um, and make him the presenter right now. So Jeff, you have, um, you should be able to, uh, there we go. That looks good. So, I trust yeah. you can see the, see everything. Yep. Thank you, thank you very much, Aaron, um, and uh, Preservation Massachusetts for inviting me to make this presentation. Uh, it covers something I think everyone's familiar with, and I'm going to deal with it in four parts today. <clears throat> I'm going to start by giving an overview by about the walls, um, where they came from. Uh, why they are important in our historic landscape. Uh, I'm then going to move on to discussing uh, how to document them, some things that uh, you can do. Uh, then I'm going to dive into something called LIDAR. Uh, it's a technology that's been available for the past few decades and has revolutionized archaeology and made stone walls jump out of the ground. And finally, I'm going to conclude. Uh, with some uh, some case studies and some recommendations to how to go forward. Um, I'd like to say that some of the topics that I'm going to be covering are, are somewhat technical, and I hope uh, that when we go live um, and on the Preservation Massachusetts website, there'll be some technical memoranda that will uh, lead folks further along on using these resources. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, Preservation Massachusetts will also host maybe an additional uh, technical session uh, where those who are interested can dive into how to actually do some of the documentation and, and to use LIDAR. So um, let me just begin with a, a very brief summary. Uh, 
stone walls are a signature fig feature of our historic landscape in New England and New York. Um, they represent one of the few remaining historic landscape features. We provide definitive information describing how colonial era farmsteads were bounded and divided into specific areas for agricultural production. Um, so with that, let me begin. Uh, and just review where uh, here in the Commonwealth, uh, our, our early com, uh, colonists, part of the Great Migration, uh, came from. They came from Northeast England, an area known as East Anglia. And uh, the names are familiar. The counties of East Anglia, East Anglia now have the names of our counties. And these folks um, were well accustomed to making walls. The same forces that created our stone affected those in New England, uh, in England as well. And so this is, this is where it began. This is uh, the glacier that covered us, covered New England, much of North America, until about 11,000 years ago. To give some scale, you can see here at the very bottom is it Boston skyline. At points, uh, the, the glacier was more than a mile thick. And the remnants of the glacier um, include such places as Cape Cod, which was the southernmost extent of the glacier. And here I've provided a, a brief uh, overview. You can see in the light green the extent of the glacier. And here we are in, in Massachusetts up here in the corner. Um, and definitely part of this, this uh, glacier coverage. But over here on the left, you can see the glacier. And it is that point where the glacier, uh, with the incredible power of, 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 of the thousands of feet of ice, uh, ground the bedrock to produce the stone which so covers the area. And stone walls are everywhere. And I did a quick review of the Macris inventory and found 557 structures. Uh, listed as stone walls, uh, there are certainly many more than that. But let's look at a general chronology uh, of stone walls and and in the historic era here. And it started with the earliest plantations uh, back in the early 1600s, and Massachusetts Bay Colony and the early towns of the 1620s and 30s with the Great Migration beginning in earnest. It's useful to point out that many of the people who came here came because they were farmers. They came here because they were tenant farmers and did not have land. And that's what the New World promised for them because in England land was everything and you were an owner if you had land. So they came with certain skills, but unfortunately the environment wasn't quite the same. But here's an overview of, of what the early landscape would have looked like up in the right corner, a cleared field uh, and bounded by a stone wall. And to the lower left here, you can see the, the kind of stone that remains in a field. This was a grazing pasture if it's not removed. And clearly it pre prevents an incredible obstacle to farming. Let's look for a minute at the types of, row of stone walls there are. And we're gonna be dealing, I'm gonna be dealing with stone in a very, in a broader sense than just walls. But these are the basic kind of walls. We have field walls, sometimes cart, Roads have walls, they're retaining walls and street walls, and of course, boundary walls, as shown in the lower right here. And what I, what's important to remember is that there was more than just boundary walls created, but divisions within the holdings of individual farmers. 
and we'll look at that in more detail later. But there was other use for stone, making animal pounds, and even for making foundations, of course. Uh, and the barn foundations that remain are some amazing constructions. Um, and this one on the right is typical, uh, though overgrown at this point, um, is the Fisk Barn in Minuteman National Historic Park. But what, what drove this incredible effort to move stones? And it was the technology, because the, pl the plows that they had were mostly wood, sometimes with iron tips, drawn by animals, most typically oxen in the early centuries. And stones were an incredible obstacle. They couldn't turn the ground over with plows of this type of technology. So it was, in some sense, a technology-driven effort to remove the stone. And for which they used stone boats. Here are some images of typical stone boats and the kind of labor that was required to get the stones onto the boats. This was often a late winter activity. Uh, sometimes the stones were partially dug out of the ground in the late fall. Water would accumulate, freeze, and push them up. And so uh, in, in the late uh, winter of, in February and March, when planting couldn't quite begin, that was the time to clear your fields of stones. This went on for years, decades. The census information that we have gives us a sense of the kind of, of land that they were faced with. And this, this is a, a tax, uh, uh, a census that, that records the kinds of land that would have been taxed. And we have pasturage and we have tillage and we have upland land and meadow and the meadow was more for grazing. This is a typical breakdown in 1771. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, General Court ordered a census and you can access this online actually with a quick search uh, of the censuses of all the towns in Massachusetts at that time. It's an incredible resource uh, who, of who owned land. And it was these landowners who were part of town meeting if you owned land, you were a member, and, and if not, you may not be a member at all. So generally, the system that they used was a two-field system where they cultivated for one year and then let it go fallow for a following year, maybe with grasses, but often to go fallow. This was a medieval system that had uh, existed for centuries and was followed here in the New World. And just very quickly, uh, there's a lot to constructing stone walls, and I, I couldn't begin to go into that, but generally the principle is one over two and two over one. Uh, the citation that I have here, which will be in my technical memoranda, um, outlines 10 different principles. Uh, clearly the skill of building walls was something that some people had as a specialization, but everybody developed a, a skill at, at doing. And so here's the, here's the mantra that everyone learned, bull strong, sheep high, ta hog tight. This was the French viewer standard. And what you see is a good example of what was a, a good stone wall for many cases. What we see today may is only a remnant and controlling one's grazing animals was of critical importance. And it led to the early legislation of expecting everyone to keep their animal in check. It was a source of great contention with the Native Americans that lived here because these farmers who came from England were used to an open field grazing system. And that was in direct conflict with the kind of agriculture that the Native Americans practiced. And so there arose legislation in the 16, mid 1600s and the appointment of fence viewers. And I'll come back to this. Many of our towns have fence viewers and it was their responsibility 
to deal with conflicts of property boundaries and to make sure that everyone kept their livestock contained. Uh, and it's a fascinating history that continues with us today, 300 and 350 years later. I also want to point out something else that's important about our stone. Uh, and I'll, I have a, a section I'm going to talk about this because this is something that's overlooked. We look at walls and we often walk past stone piles. And this was used throughout New England and certainly here um, in Massachusetts. And in the, in the lower right corner here, I have a picture of a, of a stone pile and a wall in the background. Uh, in this case, uh, a gentleman here in Lexington invited me to come look at his walls. And he said he was on the, on the boundary with Burlington, which caught my interest. And then when I saw this, I knew he was true because one of the ways in which boundaries were marked was with piling stones, uh, not just neat walls, but stones, hundreds, sometimes thousands of stones. This is a fascinating piece of our history and I'm gonna deal with it in detail because they should not be overlooked. And this document was shared with me by my friends at the Waltham Historical Society. And it's an example of what was done uh, throughout uh, New England. And that is the walls and the boundaries between towns were affirmed, sometimes by fence viewers and sometimes by people called perambulators. And this particular document from 1747 records the, 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 the walking of the boundaries of Lexington and of Waltham, which had only nine years earlier uh, separated from Watertown, which was one of the first settlements uh, going back to about 1636. And this records uh, place by place the, the stone boundaries that, that these men walked to affirm the boundaries between the two towns. And what particularly came to my attention was the fact that a gentleman by the name of Isaac Stearns purchased six lots um, in what was what were called squadrons in in uh, Waltham, and they were on the ba uh, border with Lexington. And uh, uh, there there is later historic reference to the Stearns house and. What I was able to do uh, by looking at uh, the mapping of walls that had been done by the Waltham Historical Commission was find this particular pile of stones. And this is a boundary stone, a boundary pile between Lexington and Waltham. And it actually goes back to the time when Mr. Isaac Stearns, the grandfather of the uh, Mr. Isaac Stearns, uh, who owned the land in 1747, his grandfather bought that land in 1646 and put the first stones on this corner. Uh, so now we can walk through the woods, see the boundaries of what was the earliest uh, farming boundaries in our area. This one being a modest 374 years old, obviously added to over the many, many decades and centuries. And uh, Stern's House Foundation still exists, and this is a, a, a photo that was probably taken at the turn of the 20th century. Um, a fascinating step uh, to, to validate the, the, the boundary and the people who lived uh, at that time. So I've covered a lot about <clears throat> about the general nature of stone walls, and I wanted to talk about documenting them. Uh, this is the great task ahead of us. And uh, surveying with a compass and a measuring tape and making uh, hand-drawn maps has been the way we've done it for many, many years. However, I'd like to introduce two other ways, and one of them is using your cell phone or a digital single lens reflex camera and, uh, and mapping 
those walls as you see them. And uh, finally, I'm going to deal with how to use LIDAR, a special type of remote sensing technology uh, and how that can greatly aid in our work. And I must say that the documentation for this should eventually end up in one of several different MHC forms. And I'm going to deal with that because I, uh, uh, I, uh, it's an essential part of this recording process. But I thought I'd, I'd give you an example of how to record walls with your cell phone. Your cell phone is a GPS device. Uh, when you click on your location, um, and in many cases, take your make your camera accessible to your location, you actually have a handheld GPS device, which is good in most cases to within 25 feet of where you're actually standing. And this particular wall, which I'm going to show you, which I documented quickly, is the one between Lexington and Waltham. And it doesn't look like much. The wall looks kind of broken down. And we'll see why in just a minute. But I would remiss if I didn't point out this incredible tree here. This is a white oak tree. And white oaks were often planted on boundaries. And this one has both the stone wall and a, a white oak tree on Spring Street, which was a street that existed um, certainly in the 1700s. In fact, this particular boundary is south of the Parker residence, and it was Captain Parker who was on the common that famous day in April 19th. But standing at Spring Street here and walking west, I was able to take a series of photographs. Unfortunately, I did this during the summer, so you can see the luxuriant poison ivy that covers this particular stone wall. But as I walked further east, I saw more of the wall until lo and behold, about 200 feet. West of the of Spring Street, I see this enormous wall here. It's a filled stone wall with two sides and an immense amount of fill of more stone. This is an exceptional example of a boundary wall. This is not going to move anywhere quickly. So this is the kind of thing you can get. And I use some cell phone software called Soloig Locator. Um, when you take an image, you record your location information, and that can be mapped. And in this particular app, it shows me actually the directions that I took the photograph. Um, and I'll have more in my technical uh, memoranda about that. But I was able to take that data and through a rather simple process, map that. In this case, I used Bing Maps. Not the most sophisticated GIS tool, but it got the job done because I was able to make, make a collection of photographs. And these photographs, I, I then keyed to locations, which I've shown here. This is a, a, a simple process, and there are more sophisticated ways to do this um, with other software. But it gets you going, and it gives the viewer and the, uh, the form real information. In this case, I presented about the street view on the left and a satellite photo image on the right, which shows the coverage. And here's our famous boundary, boundary tree. And that's photo number two in this case. I wanted to mention the use of uh, your digital cameras, because devices are sold rather inexpensively for giving you very good resolution, uh, geospatial resolution. Uh, the one on the left, if you use Nikon products, is $58 is a great buy. You can get something much more sophisticated for Canons and their others as well. And uh, don't forget the wide angle lens. I know that many of us see these incredible packages for digital cameras and they're thousands of dollars. Uh, you can buy older models of many digital cameras online for a few hundred dollars and then buy the lenses separately and a GPS unit. And for six or seven hundred dollars, you've got a high resolution GPS image capturing system, uh, much better than a cell phone. But if nothing else is available, cell phone does work. 
And so which MHC form do you use? So I reached out to Michael Steinitz, who's the Director of Preservation Planning at Mass Star Commission, and his answer was, it depends. And wall, stru walls are structures, and we, you can document them on structure forms. But if they're part of wider area, uh, part of a landscape, you might use an area form. But then there's also a landscape form that documents fields and orchards and woodlots. Uh, so you have a choice, but you have to think about the context, and that's really important. There are specialized forms for Stark archaeology as well. But think about the context because that is the critical element. So that somewhat ties up the the documentation, I wanted to mention that often the question is put forward about dating stone walls. And it's not necessarily an exact science. Walls evolved over decades, in some cases, centuries. And so the town records, uh, registry records, census information are the ones that are widely available. But there's also a technique which is used particularly in archaeology in the Near East uh, called OSL, optical stimulated luminescence. Uh, it's a somewhat expensive technique. It's not used a great deal, but it can get you pretty close. And what it can show you is if you had a stone that was exposed to sunlight and then covered, it would tell you the amount of time it was without sunlight, and hence, doing simple deduction, you can get an estimate of the time that that stone had been buried. Uh, an interesting but expensive technique. And if you really want to get down to recording the locations, you can use one of the high-tech devices, like a Trimble uh, GNSS, which will get you sub-meter accuracy for a pocket-sized device. Uh, for a few thousand dollars. But let me uh, step into uh, something that has caught my attention, uh, and that's the use of LIDAR. And we, we all see the world around us through reflected light. And there's al always a lot of invisible light, because we know insects and uh, other animals see light in different frequencies than our own, infrared particularly for insects. But LIDAR is a, as a technology somewhat in the radar end of the spectrum. And the way to think about this is as if you were given a dark room and a flashlight and said you can explore this room with a flashlight, but you can only blink your flashlight. You can only click it. You can't hold it on. And that's what the laser type ray of a, of a LIDAR device does. It gives you one glimpse of a ground area. And the advantage of LIDAR is that when the, the image comes back to you, it just doesn't show you the shape of where the image struck a landscape, but tells you about its latitude, longitude, and elevation. And this type of technology has become so sophisticated that it's now ca capable of recording landscapes in matters in, in distances of centimeters. All topographic maps today are made using LIDAR. And there are several ways this is done. The way that we're going to look at LIDAR imagery today for stone walls is, is used in airborne LIDAR, a device um, that's probably about three feet square and is flown on a, on a, a low-flying aircraft, and, and it captures the ground. And I'm going to show you images, and I think you'll see. But this is, this is the technology that has given us a, a real edge in many 
parts of, of the world. And I'm going to talk about these, some of the amazing things that have changed our views of, 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 the, of the world and civilizations. Uh, one of them is uh, Angkor Wat, uh, the, the 13th century uh, ceremonial center in Cambodia, which was thought to be fairly large, about nine square kilometers. But when they ran the LIDAR, they found that it was 35 square kilometers or more. And in fact, what was thought to be a ceremonial center and a burial site of a king who spent 32 years of his reign building his own burial site turned out to be a city of 600,000 people. In our part of the world, in, in the Maya, the lowlands of the Maya in uh, Guatemala, Mexico, and further south, the, there is extensive uh, record of their civilization. And in uh, one a survey that was done, um, they found more than 60,000 houses, palaces, and elevated highways that had never been seen before. Uh, part of this is due to the fact that in, in, in tropical environments, houses are often made of mud brick. And after a few hundred rainy seasons, that brick gets reduced to a, a pile of four or five inches high. The walls of the houses become four or five inches high and getting covered with, with uh, forest litter and not really visible to the person walking over it. But LIDAR captures those distances because LIDAR has the capability of seeing through vegetation. And um, I'm going to give you a very local example of that, but just to give you a, a sense of, of, of what you can see with what's called bare ground LIDAR uh, is, is the site of Caracol in the Maya lowlands. And on the left-hand side here, you can see the ceremonial center, but you can see the immense terracing that took place and these different structures that all just kind of pop out of the ground. And this was a case where they'd excavated for 25 years. And then after they did the LIDAR, they found the whole area of what they thought was a limited site was eight times larger. And I have one more example here of the power of LIDAR. And you're looking at a hillside in what was historically Palestine, today modern Israel. Uh, and this hillside is, is now planted in, in grain uh, seasonally. Um, looks like many other hillsides. But the LIDAR shows you something very different. And this rectangular structure that you see below the ground was, in fact, the camp of the Sixth Roman Legion, which was sent there uh, to protect one of the main trade routes uh, in, in the um, in the Near East between uh, the port of Caesarea, uh, Palestina, and uh, the inland uh, routes to uh, as far east as Afghan, Afghanistan and China. So this is the view that you don't see at all on the ground. And you can begin to make out some of the boundaries of the walls within this camps, this rectangular camp that was typical of the legion, a legion of 5,000 men and a lot of support personnel that lived outside of the camp. In fact, where the legions set up camp, towns often formed. But if you dig below the surface, you see this, and this you are looking at is the roadway in the left-hand corner of the camp, one of the roadways, and this is the second one down here. The one you're looking at in the left corner is this roadway up here. And this is one of the rooms that you saw as those red squares. So the LIDAR clearly points you to what's well below the ground, in this case, as much as three meters. I'd remiss, be remiss to point out that the Romans were notable engineers, and what you see in this little small segment here is part of their plumbing system. They actually installed sewer systems in their camps. Um, anyhow, let's come back to Massachusetts here. 
and look at LIDAR in Massachusetts. There's an immense amount of LIDAR data available free for downloading it. And what I'm, uh, I w I've highlighted here is some of the best LIDAR um, that's available in the western part of the state. As the years have gone on from 2010, the LIDAR coverage has improved. All this is available through MassGIS, um, and we are fortunate to have a, a, a branch of our, our state government that provides an enormous amount of information. And this is just one tiny piece of what they provide. But I'm going to show you some of the images uh, of uh, LIDAR here. Um, and this the links will take you there. I hope maybe in a future presentation I can walk folks through the process of using some free software and, and analyzing this because it saves you so much time when you can actually see the walls and go to them. And then the software actually tells you where the wall is uh, because the actual geographic coordinates of all the features of the wall are recorded in the LIDAR. And there are various qualities, as I mentioned. The better qualities, uh, QL1 and QL2, refer to the density, the number of points within a particular area. And obviously, had the more points, the greater the density and the, the greater the coverage in the landscape. And the best as is the QL1, QL2, which we have in Western Massachusetts. Um, you can certainly do a lot with the LIDAR in Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, I could give you lots of examples, but um, maybe that will wait for the next presentation. But I'm sure that you'd probably want to read about this. And the article I've cited here, which will be in my handout, was published in 2014 called Rediscovering the Archaeological Landscape of Southern New England Using Airborne LIDAR. And uh, this is an example of what's called bare ground LIDAR. Uh, all the vegetation has been stripped away, and you can see the boundaries of the fields. Um, they just jump right off, off the landscape. And I'm going to show you one uh, out in western Massachusetts. Uh, this this is a this is a, a, a multiple house site. These are a house here, and these are the walls. And we're at a scale here um, where this is about 100 meters. That's 300 feet. You can imagine having this in your hand and walking uh, through the through the, the ground area and, and, and being able to verify what you're seeing with a map like this in your hand. And I wanted to give you one interesting case study. Um, this is an area in the suburban Boston of Waltham. Um, and a, a map here on the left. And on the right, you can see a typical forested hill that might not appear to be anything particularly different than what you see all the time. But this is with full tree canopy. And on the left over here, you see it without uh, uh, without any cover, uh, just a, what we call leaf off condition. But the LIDAR, the LIDAR shows a lot more. And it shows the stone walls, as you just saw in that presentation. It also shows uh, some roadways. And this is where the ground verification becomes important, because this type of uh, uh, imagery provides different types of clues uh, to what's what's there, and you have to go and look. So I'm going to going to dive a little deeper here. This is an elevation map, so the higher elevations are red, and the lower ones are yellow. But I walked out with a map at hand. This is an example of LIDAR that I, a LIDAR image I made with, with what's available around here. Um, and I went out and mapped it, and this is what I found. And uh, there was a survey done, uh, literally transit survey uh, of walls uh, in the same area as part of Waltham's effort to document their stone walls. Interestingly enough, when you walk through this area uh, in season, not all of this is visible. And I was particularly caught by the walls that I was able to see with the LIDAR over here on the left. 
and drilling down, we can see some of these walls in great detail. And so I investigated this first with the LIDAR and verifying it in the field. And then I went out there and in the middle of winter with no leaf coverage, I see the very tops of what were fairly extensive wall system. But what was interesting about these walls rather than be field walls is that they bounded a wetland. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead there. Bounding wetlands appears to be a, another form of, of field bounding, possibly to protect the animals from getting mired in mud, but also to control access to the water. And I thought, is this odd? And I checked out some other nearby places, literally um, half a mile away. Uh, fortunately, our wetlands are protected. This was next to a large uh, multifamily residential development and found the same walls bounding uh, wetlands. So I would tell you that it's more than the fields. It's actually the wetlands that also get bounded. And this is the kind of thing that LIDAR can show you so clearly. And finally, I want to deal with a few case studies. Um, as you may have guessed at this point, I, I live in Lexington. And uh, recently, we've had a, a, a major development take, take place on our, our boundary. Um, and it's an area that was once uh, the land that belonged to the Bowman family. Uh, they started acquiring land back as early as 1714. And at, by the probably the 1800s, they had several hundreds of acres. This is their house, which existed until one of their houses that existed until 1905. Uh, Nathan Bowman um, gets attributed to this house because he was a Lexington militiaman um, on April 19th. And going back to the to the same document I showed you about the perambulation of the border, uh, you there's a there's a mention of Nathaniel Bow, Bowman, and uh, in this case, you can see part of his boundary was a heap of large stones near his house, possibly that house that you saw there. Unfortunately, in the 1950s, they expanded Route Two and I blew through a lot of what was uh, the Bowman land. But surprisingly, a lot of their field walls remain. And using LIDAR and, and terrestrial uh, survey, I was able to find many of their walls. And this is just some of the walls uh, that I was able to find. As you go through the intersection here of Watertown Street and Route 2, you don't get to appreciate the extensive stone walls that are not only here, but extend much further north. The One of the Bowman houses was actually uh, on the north end of Pleasant Street, uh, Watertown Street here. This was Watertown Street. So this is an example of being able to find walls um, at, that are the site of a now um, assisted living uh, and memory care unit that's being constructed. Um, and I cite this as an example of how uh, how the walls uh, were recorded as part of the process of providing plans, but when it came to the approval, uh, our planning board uh, gave the developer uh, free reign to remove the roads. Uh, so this is where we have to step up because there are laws that protect stone walls, but they need to be enforced. And although uh, the, the first one I cite here in uh, chapter 266, section 105, that the penalty for removing walls is only $10, but being arrested without warrant is something uh, far more serious. And uh, the second, it deals with boundary monuments. And these are particularly important because uh, removing boundary markers uh, is is just without um, without excuse. And 
you can see that in this section 94 laws. These will I will make available to you uh, so that you can share them with the people locally. And I should also mention that, that walls are protected as historic and archaeological sites. Most major projects have to do environmental notification forms, and you're required to indicate whether there are historic or archaeological resources, and they should be checked, and obviously they need to be surveyed. So there are tools available to us. So th this is my pitch. We need to change our statewide legislation and have more penalties for removing stone walls. $100 a stone would be not unreasonable. I had a homeowner here in Lexington who spent several hundred thousand dollars restoring their home and asked the builder, could you make me a, a fire pit out of some nice stone walls, stone? And he said, sure, $500 a foot. So that underscores the value there is in these walls for local landscapers. So we need to revise our legislation and we need to protect historic archeological structures. And we need to have local bylaws. And my thanks to Chris Skelly, who's director of local programs, who's put together uh, some of the bylaws that have been passed. I know this is a lot of work going to town meeting, but it's important to protect the walls and they need to be more than just part of scenic roads bylaws because there's a lot more out there than just scenic road, scenic roads that have stone walls. So this is um, where I'm, I'm trying to tie this up. We need to pass town bylaws and we need statewide legislation to protect this historic landscape feature. And so step number one is enforcement. We need to get our town fence viewers to enforce this. And we need to have surveys done uh, by our historic commissions and our conservation commissions. Interestingly enough, in the, the suburban environments where there are large conservation lands, uh, they are the care caretakers of some of the greatest historic landscapes that are remaining in our Commonwealth. So um, I'm going to end, uh, end here. Um, I hope there's some questions and uh, perhaps we'll have a chance to uh, deal with this uh, later on in another presentation. So Erin, um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, thank you very, very, very much, Jeff. This was um, this was e extremely fascinating, and I think your um, your message um, underscoring um, what we've um, what we heard about in um, you know another presentation on stone walls that we had in June um, is that it really does come down to all preservation is local, and um, to in order to preserve um, historic stone walls, it really does start. Um, it starts with um, individuals going out there, finding the walls, seeing where they are, doing uh, the documentation necessary finding out what you have and passing um, local ordinances enabled um, able to protect them. But um, I think you're right. Um, some of the, uh, I remember talking about what the uh, Mass General Laws were back when we were uh, discussing um, the uh, Stonewall nomination in 2018. Um, and it, it, it does seem uh, woefully inadequate for, um, for, um, for, for, um, for stone walls but um i think you've given our um our attendees a lot to think about and i think um i know when we were speaking about this presentation you really wanted to uh, give people um you know give them the ability to really go out and start um examining and finding historic stone walls and documenting them and figuring out you know what they have and um i think it's uh very, very, um, it, it's very timely. And yes, as uh, Jeff had said, um, you know, there's an awful lot of information that he shared with us today, um, and all of the um, uh, resources that he uh, he referenced, um, they will be available on the Preservation Massachusetts website. Um, and if people are interested, um, and if you're interested, you know, just you can type a. Um, if people are interested, you can, you know, just say yes in the chat box. But um, if Jeff was to do a um, a more technical presentation on how to actually, you know, read lidar, um, I know he went into a lot of. Um, it's, it's it's a little more technical presentation. But if people and if people are interested, Preservation Massachusetts will happily hold a uh, another a virtual webinar led by Jeff, uh, where he'll walk us through how to read um, lidar maps. 
So um, wonderful. Oh yes, we're we're getting some yeses. So I think um, Jeff, I think this is something um, that we'll be working on in the next couple of months. So great. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, we're getting a lot of you know, thanks to Jeff for sharing the presentation, of sharing his information and doing the presentation. Um, does anybody have any specific questions that they'd like to ask um, Jeff about um, historic stone walls, any of the uh, examples he gave? Um, I know there was, this was an information-packed presentation. Nobody has any questions. No questions. Hmm. Um, hmm. If there are no more questions, um, I have a, 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 a brief passage, a couple of sentences I'd like to read. Um, this is from a great book. I'm going to list some references in my uh, uh, technical information, but this book published in 1990 um, called Sermons in Stone, The Stone Walls of New England and New York by Susan Alport. Um, it's a great overview. Um, Bob Thorson, who made the presentation in July, June, has some good books. And there's also another one called The Granite Kiss, which is about how to make walls. But I just wanted to read this a couple of sentences from uh, Sermons in Stone. And it uh, deals with the fact that in 1871, the Department of Agriculture uh, published statistics on fences in the United States. They did a survey of what constituted fences in different parts of the United States. And in Connecticut, um, the stone walls amounted to 20,505 miles. In Rhode Island, there were 14,000 miles of stone walls. And Half of the walls in Massachusetts are 32,960 miles were of stone walls. And in New York, there was a staggering 95,364 miles of stone walls. Uh, by one estimate, that would have built the pyramids in Egypt 100 times over. So clearly, we have an incredible resource here. And uh, I hope we can step up and do more to preserve this um, in the future. Thanks, Erin. Well, Jeff, um, a huge thank you from um, from Preservation Massachusetts uh, for for um, for doing this presentation for for running it on on your on your own. I didn't have to do um, anything, so I actually got to enjoy the presentation. Um, but thank you so very much for um, for sharing your um, your expertise and your knowledge with us, and also your willingness to do a more technical presentation. It sounds like that's something that people would definitely be interested in. So um, more to come on that. But um, unless anybody has any additional questions. Um, We'll just um, wrap up by thanking everybody for um, for watching um, live or on um, or on YouTube. And again, um, uh, Jeff is preparing a lot of um, of some is preparing some reference documents, which will be available for download on the Preservation Massachusetts website. Um, I will send an email out um, once this video is up and live on our site, and we have those documents there for you to download. Um, and um, and also, if there's um, if anybody has any thoughts about future um, topics for discussion, um, please let us know. Um, this is actually going to be the last um, preservation conversation for our summer schedule. Um, we will be transitioning to our fall schedule come September, and um, on a date to be determined, um, our next presentation is going to be on historic landscape preservation. Um, and then we have a couple other thoughts about um, preservation conversations uh, for the uh, month of October, November, and December. But um, thank you again so very much for joining us. Um, Jeff, thank you once again, huge thank you for, for all you do and for doing this presentation and putting um, so much work and thought into it. Um, and if anybody has any questions um, that they're watching this on the uh, video and they um, have a specific question they'd like to ask Jeff, his email is up on the screen or you could email any of the Preservation Massachusetts staff and we'll make sure we uh, try to find uh, answer your question. So with that, um, 
we will say thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day and um happy labor day happy end to summer oh i see we have somebody coming with that oh that was that was jeff <laughs> another thank you to jeff so lots of um lots of thanks for jeff and sharing his uh, his thoughts today so everybody have a wonderful day and um we will see you at we will see you at our next preservation conversation.